Uh, brothers and sisters, um, thank you for uh, in, well, inviting us and then me substituting for him and you being happy with the substitution. Um, of course, no one can place Brother Asim, but uh, inshallah, I'll do my best to deliver the, the topic. It's one actually that's very close to my heart, and I think it's really important that more and more Muslims discuss the real function of Ramadan and, and what it means to be a Muslim in Ramadan. That's something that um, has been lost over the centuries, uh, as, well, as I'm going to sort of set out. When we look at uh, Ramadan today, as Muslims, wherever we are, whether it's in the UK, in India, in the Arab world, wherever you are, when we think of our association with Ramadan is what? Taraweeh, luxurious, delicious, huge spreads of iftar, suhoor time with families, uh, tilawat al-Quran, obviously, um, and the very, very beautiful, nice, family-friendly environment. And there's nothing wrong with that, per se. It's, it's, there's definitely huge positive values we take from this time for internal reflection, introspection, um, istighfar, all of these things is beautiful. It's, it's, it's very well packaged. However, in all of that, we've lost the essence of Ramadan because your title was Ramadan in times of oppression. And in reality, if we look at the history of Islam and the history of the Prophet and the generation that followed, Ramadan was always occurring in a time of oppression. There was always oppression happening. Um, and the Muslims, by their very nature, saw it as a month of action, a month of jihad, a month of, a month of struggle, a month of striving. Today we've lost that. Today we've made it all about the, we've almost secularized the concept of Ramadan. We've, we've taken away the true essence of the faith. Um, and that's why we're having this conversation. Was, how do you do Ramadan in times of oppression? Now that everyone is watching li the live stream genocide, um, it's only because it's being live streamed. But if we go back even last year or the year before, the year before, counted many Ramadans as you can think of, there's always been oppression in the Ummah, whether it's in India, whether it's in the Balkans and the Bosnian genocide whether it's the ongoing detention without trial and torture of our brothers in Guantanamo Bay, or, or the, the genocide that was taking place in Syria, or in, uh, in Afghanistan for 40 years of, of war. Um, we go down to the south of the, the, the African continent, see what's happening in Sudan, in the Central African Republic, in Somalia. It's, it's always been there. Obviously, with Palestine, it touches a different nerve of the Ummah for obvious reasons, and then that's for, uh, for good reasons. But ultimately, we have become disconnected from the Ummah, and that's a reflection of our disconnection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. There's a very beautiful narration where a man went uh, to the Prophet of Masjid al Nabawi, and Abdullah ibn Abbas was in itikaf at the time. And he saw this man, and the man looked a bit troubled. He saw from his face, he looked a bit worried. So he said to him, Yo, my brother, you know, you look very concerned. Is there something I can help you with? And he related he had some problem uh, with another individual. And Ibn Abbas said, do you want me to come and intervene? He said, yes, if you could, it would help me. So Ibn Abbas begins to get up and leave the masjid. And the man suddenly realizes that, hold on, you're in ittikaf, you shouldn't be leaving. And he said to him, please, you're in the gaff. how can you leave? And Ibn Abbas began to cry. And he said, you see that man buried there, the Prophet He said, I heard him say that to walk in the service of your brother is more valuable to Allah than 10 years of it in this masjid, Masjid Nabawi. How many of us would love to go for Umrah to Medina? How many of us would love to go to, do, to Ziyar in Medina in, in, in Ramadan? How many of us would like to imagine doing ittikaf in Medina? And yet what we're being told in this narration is that to help your brother in his time of difficulty, to walk in his path until his need is fulfilled, is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than 10 years of ittikaf. SubhanAllah, and this is what I'm saying, when we, lose, we lose the essence of the month. Because Ramadan is all about trials. Ramadan is about... Uh, weakening our ties to the dunya, to this, this worldly life, and attaching ourselves to the akhirah. Um, 
if we look at the first time in, in, in Ramadan, before the revelation of Siyam came down, before the revelation of fasting came down, there was 15 years of Islam. And in that time, even though fasting wasn't uh, obligated or mandated at the time, the Muslims still suffered during Ramadan. It was in Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ, that, as we know, the Wahi came down, that uh, the Quran was revealed. That shook him. He was scared. He was frightened. He had to run back to his wife who had to comfort him. It was a personal test. He thought he was going insane. He thought he was seeing visions. So that was a very frightening experience. It was a personal tribulation. It was also in Ramadan that the Prophet ﷺ had suffered the loss, the demise, the departure of his beloved wife Khadija. And this followed, incidentally, three years of sanctions. Like we see in Gaza today, the Quraysh put the Muslims in Mecca under sanctions. Um, the, not just the Muslims, but their protectors as well, the tribes, the full collective punishment that because they wouldn't surrender Muhammad Sallallahu to them, they were going to put economic sanctions on them, a social, economic, financial boycott. And just like today, we see the parallels in Gaza and we, people at the time could hear the cries of the children from starvation, they were eating leaves, they were eating barks of tree, animal hide, anything just to keep to stay alive. Many lost their lives in that time. And Khadija ultimately became sick and her illness, she never recovered. And the Prophet had to bury her during that time. She was his internal protector. She was the one who you to seek comfort in. And losing was huge. And then in the same month, he then lost his, his exterior protection, Abu Talib, the one who was defending him against the tribes who wanted to, to, to murder him and exile him. So both of these incidents happened during Ramadan. It's almost like the month is there to prepare you mentally and, and spiritually to take on hardships. Um, and when you, you demonstrate that ex exemplary sabr you're meant to, that's what re makes you reach spiritual highs because the dunya means nothing when you're tested this way. You automatically connect to Allah. Every one of us can think back to a time where we had a huge tribulation in our life. It could be an illness, the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, imprisonment, um, whatever it is, a uh, problem at workplace. But when you're in that difficulty, you automatically detach yourself from dunya. You know, you, you, dunya doesn't matter to you. Now this was pre before the siyam was mandated so siyam was mandated in the second year after hijra right so this was the muslims that met migration and then they had the first year and then the second year when fasting was prescribed at the same time there's another act of worship that was prescribed in the muslims fighting is prescribed upon you even though you hate it so all of a sudden two things happen. The Muslims are being requested to fast from Fajr to Maghrib for one month. They used to fast, but not at this to this extent. And secondly, they're asked to fight. Um, it's been given permission to fight. So we know that the great battle of Badr, the defining battle in the history of Islam, took place in Ramadan. And this was between um, the Muslims who weren't prepared for war. They weren't ready for battle. They thought they were going to go in and get the caravan and just get the booty and it'd be, they weren't equipped and suddenly it turned into a full-scale war with the Quraysh heavily armed you know three times the size of the army came out for a full battle and because in this time the Muslims are fasting they're involved in, in jihad and the all this time they see the angels coming down we talk about Layla al Qadr and seeing the angels and the, the signs with the angels there is it a peaceful night the Muslims on the 16th night Ramadan the Prophet is praying the entire night for victory for the Muslims. The next day, they see the angels come down. They actually see them, they encapsulate them, and, and for them forever, that month is marked as a month of victory. Shahr al-Nasr, a month of victory, a month of, of uh, jihad, a month of struggle. They automatically associated every Ramadan thereafter with Badr. That was their connection. We associate Ramadan with our iftar or with the Tarawi, with the beautiful recitation. For the early Muslims, it was Badr. And that's why it changed the psychosis. So the next year, we have the Battle of Uhud, which didn't take place in Badr. It actually took place in Shawal, the first few days of Shawal. So what, would, what does that mean? It means that the warning, the, the news that came that the Quraysh were raising an army to attack Medina and to finish off what they couldn't at Badr, that came in the last few nights of Ramadan. So imagine now, 
the Muslims in Medina. It's their first Ramadan that they're actually now they're nearly completing it and they're in their masjid, they're in it, the gaf, they're in Masjid Nabawi. They're having that spiritual reflection. And then the call comes that, look, an army is coming to wipe you out. So suddenly the last few nights of Ramadan, Laylat al-Qadr, all of these tiny things that we, we, we spend all our time in the masjid, they're still preparing for battle. They're getting ready. They, Eid is spent preparing to defend Medina. It's not about getting new clothes and fancy dress and having parties. No, this is real. This is the struggle. This is what Islam is about. Spreading Islam, da'wah, jihad. And that's why this battle then takes place a few years, uh, a few days after Eid. If we fast forward a couple of more years, the fifth year after Hijrah, the great battle of Khandak. Again, this took place in Shawal. But for th almost the entirety of the month before that, the Muslims were preparing for it. As we know, this was the time when the Quraysh raised an army of over a thousand people, or 10,000 people, apologies, 10,000 people, the biggest army that ever been seen in the peninsula. They had uh, uh, united the, the tribes in, in, in the peninsula. They had got the Jewish uh, tribes who were allied to the Muslims to betray them, and they were surrounding them. This was going to be a genocide. They make no doubt about it. They were there to wipe the Muslims off the face of the earth. And what did the Muslims do the entire Ramadan? Digging the trench. There's so many narrations of how difficult this was, how cold it was, how hungry the Muslims were. They used to tie stones to their chest, to their tummy, to keep the hunger at bay. The Prophet ﷺ was seen having two stones in his chest because he, that shows how hungry he was. He was involved in digging. He wasn't just standing watching and carrying on the du'a, saying, you guys carry on the hard work. Everybody is involved. There was fear in the community. But none of this paralyzed them. They were involved in action, doing what they could to protect the Muslim, to protect the community. And the, the siege began after Eid and went on for one month. But you, again, you see the importance of Ramadan. It wasn't seen as just a month where we, where we switch off. No, it, the month is, is for action. That's what it's to remember. The Badr is the defining moment for Ramadan. And when, well, a lesson that we need to take is when we think of Ramadan, Badr has to be our standard. You know, not how many pakori you had on your plate. Badr has to be the standard of, of your Ramadan. A few years later, the eighth year after Hijrah, Fath al Makkah. This is when the Muslims came back and they conquered, they conquered Makkah. Now, this is really interesting. Um, in all the battles so far, we see Ramadan. What does Ramadan do? It's a time of purification. It's time to bring you to a spiritual high so that you are prepared to, to deal with the tests of life. We see it in Badr. It's a perfect time. They've had 16 days of Ramadan. They've been preparing. They've been physically, spiritually, they're at the high that they can take on this army. That's why these things happen in Ramadan. Because outside of them, perhaps, you don't have that, that purification of your soul to deal with these issues. Uhud is the same. You think of the Shuhada and Uhud. These are 70 people who, who, who were killed. They were cleansed in Ramadan. Imagine the entire month. They're fasting. They're praying. They're... Um, doing their abada, doing their askar, and then it comes to the battle. And they're ready. You remember in Uhud, it was a moment of Khalid bin Walid, when he was fighting for the Quraysh, and he, he did the route, he turned the route, he turned around, and he divided the Muslims. And many Muslims fled at that time. Others stood their ground. When the rumors went, the Prophet was being killed. People stopped fighting. Now, this is a, a battle. You have a, a split second decision to decide what to do. So, at this moment in time, if your preparation is up to speed, if you're spiritually high, you will make the right decision at that point. You're not going to move. You're not going to budge. And that's what we see, again, happening. We saw the Khandak as well. They're ready. They're going to have a month-long siege. So Ramadan is the perfect time to prepare them for that. Now, in Fath al-Makkah, something different is required of the Muslims. They're coming back in after such a long time away from their homeland. These are the people who have butchered them, who have tortured them, who have persecuted them. And now they are at your mercy. You are in charge, you are in power, and they're at your mercy. Now, because you've had weeks and weeks of Ramadan, a spiritual preparation, and the Prophet Sallam, his words when he came in, humble, head down on his camel, entering, making askar, and then when everyone's waiting for the bloodbath, what does he say? That I'm going to say to you what the Prophet Yusuf, what my brother Yusuf said to his brothers. La tasribu alaykum al there is no blame on you today. May Allah forgive you. Incredible, the general amnesty that comes in from the Prophet 
and the Sahaba, you know, these are people who their family members are tortured, they were tortured, and they're seeing their persecutors in the streets. And what did they do? Because Allah has prepared their hearts for this moment during Ramadan with infinite mercy and love and forgiveness, they're able to fulfill that command. There is not a single incident of a Sahaba taking the law into his own hands. And the parallel that I see today was in Afghanistan when the great, uh, the victory happened a few years ago, when the, the Mujahideen had the, the, the people, the, the collaborators at their mercy. And these are people who tortured them, who hurt them. And yet when the Amir al-Mumin gave his, his uh, amnesty that no one's gonna be hurt, now there's peace. No one's gonna take any revenge. That individuals are walking the streets who are fully involved with the collab with, with the American and NATO forces in killing, in slaughtering, in torturing, in detaining these people, yet no one gets hurt. It's the same Lat three Balekmunyom. We're looking forward now. The war is finished, so there's no there's no revenge punishments. So again, this is 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 what Ramadan does for you. It prepares you for the moment, it prepares you for the victory, it prepares you for the battle. After the Prophet dies, we've got a few more examples. We've got the Battle of Qadassiyah, 15th after Hijra. This was one of the great battles between the Muslims and the Persians. And the Prophet's uncle, Saad ibn Abi Waqas, was leading that army. And it's said that the reason that they succeeded in that battle was because of their sleep discipline. Now, when you hear the word sleep discipline today, what do you think of? You need to have a good eight hours sleep Otherwise, you cannot function in the day. And if, if you don't get enough sleep at night time, it's going to cause you diabetes, uh, cardiac problems, digestive problems, all sorts of illnesses. The sleep discipline that the Muslims in Qadasiyah had was the fact that they used to pray during the night. They used to pray during the night. And because it's Ramadan, we know the, 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 the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Man qama Ramadan, Iman wa tisabud, that the person who prays, spends the night in, in prayer, in the night of Ramadan, with Iman and Ihtisab, seeking Allah's reward, that he'll be after his sins forgiven. His previous sins will be forgiven. So these Muslims are involved in a battle. They're against an army that is 200,000 strong. Their soldiers are only 30,000. Yet they're praying every night. And in the first two days of this three-day battle, there were 6,000 shuhada, one-fifth of the army, 20% of the soldiers were shuhada, were shaheed. So it's a very ferocious battle. And they would battle from Fajr to Maghrib every day. And they were so exhausted by Maghrib, it was just generally understood, you retreat to your camps, that's the end of the battle for that day. And you'll come back out after Fajr at daybreak again. It wasn't a code, it wasn't written, it was just the armies were just exhausted and they just didn't want to fight at night time. So they go back. And Saad ibn Abi Waqas, he starts basically looking during his, to, to see everyone's what they're doing. And they're praying during the night. And he says to them, he says, them, all I need from you, he goes, the group that's going to succeed in this battle, it's going to carry on like this. But we don't have the numbers. So we keep losing at the rate we're losing, we're going to lose. But the, 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 the army that's going to be victorious is the one who can give it one more hour. The one who can show resilience, who can persevere for an extra hour when everyone else is exhausted. And so, Aqa Ibn Amr, one of the, the great Sahaba, the man known as a man equal to 100 men, he used to say, with patience comes victory. You know, with patience comes victory. That was his cry to the people. And Saad said to them, I just give me one more hour, keep fighting after Maghrib. And because the Muslims were so used to, when they came back from that battle after Maghrib and they slept, they would arise to pray during the night. So they were used to it. That was their sleep discipline. So then on the third day of the battle after Maghrib and the Persians were retreating, the Muslims kept fighting and they would let go. And they fought from Fajr that day until Fajr the next day, 24 hours. And only because of their sleep discipline. So they saw that, that Qiyam al-Layl, that uh, the Hajjud, that Tarawi, that long Salah, that was their training for a higher purpose. Not just training so that your legs get a bit you know, more lean and you get... You get tired, you can learn how to sleep on your feet as we do today, but it was for a, a, a true purpose. And, and, and that purpose was for, for Jihad Fi Sabeel Allah. Just checking the time I've got. Yeah, I think I've got a time to go to a few more examples. Um, and very briefly, 
In the year 92 after Hijra, we have the conquest of Andalusia with Tariq ibn Ziyad. We also have the following year, the conquest of India, by Muhammad bin Qasim was 17 years old at the time he conquered Sindh. Again, these expeditions were taking place during Ramadan. It wasn't the case, but look, it's Ramadan. We can pause the, the da'wah, we can pause the jihad for, for this month. Let's carry on in Shawwal. I mean, there's no there's no reason why not to, right? There's, but there's a sense of urgency in the Muslims. And they realize, again, this is the month of jihad, this is the month of struggle, this is the month of victory, that the blessings of Allah come down in this month. This is when the angels came down. They have been heard these stories from their predecessors, from their predecessors, who you remember, brother. And again, I, I keep emphasizing this point because it's so important. The reason that Islam was a, uh, that Ramadan was a month of victory historically was because Muslims tagged it alongside brother, to use ter kind of terminology. If you were to put Ramadan and do a post on it, your hashtag would be brother. I mean, that was it. That, that, that was the defining moment. We don't see it that way anymore. That's why sometimes we really need to mark is the, the 69th of Ramadan and the 17th of Ramadan the, the, the day of Badr. In our calendar, we need to celebrate it every year with, with, with our families, with our children, with our communities. It has to become an annual event in the calendar that this is what Ramadan is about. It's not just about your, your you know, taking... I know selfies or taking photos of your your star plates, recipes, posting on Instagram. If you go on Instagram now, or you go into TikTok, or one of these, and you put in Ramadan. It's all about recipes. It's all about food. Ironically, it, it's the month where you're meant to be fasting and refraining from food and drink and everything else. The entire your feed is going to be about when you look at Ramadan. It's going to be about um, food and not just basic food, luxurious food. You know the Sahab when they broke their iftar, it was very simple, very simple. Because they understood the, the the essence of it is to be to to give up what you want for the sake of Allah to accept the taqwa and to also develop a sense of you know understanding what it means to be without food. But how do you get that sense of being without food and suddenly you, you, everyone engages in mass acts of gluttony once the sun sets? You know, it, 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 and sometimes they're unable unable to even pray after that because their bellies are so full. But look at the 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 difference. I mean, when you look at Gaza today and you're looking at the pictures, may Allah forgive us for allowing this to happen on our watch and you see what's happening and how can you really, really just engage in your food in the way that we used to in the past? It's, it's just not possible. But uh, again, unfortunately, that this this is the way Allah maybe brings us back to the true meaning of, of Ramadan. Just two more historical examples, uh, which are very, very key. Um, especially when you talk about Palestine, is on the 27th night of Ramadan in the year 584 after Hijra or 1187 by the Gregorian calendar, the, the great battle of Hittin took place between Salah ad-Din Ayyubi and the Crusaders. This was in Ramadan. This was the, the battle to end the Crusader occupation of, of Palestine and eventually of Jerusalem as well. Salah ad-Din enters Jerusalem during Ramadan. And remember, before this, you've had nearly a century of oppression, a century of no azan in Masjid Al-Aqsa, no salah in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Masjid Al-Aqsa being used as a barn for farmyard animals. The Muslims being living under crusader occupation. You know, I mean, it's important to see the time scale because when you look at a timeline in history, they look like little blips, you know, 1099 to 1187, crusader occupation. But when you're living through it, it seems like it'll never end. The Zionist occupation of Palestine is only 75 years old. So it's actually less than the Crusader occupation. But you can see, I think we're seeing the collapse of Zionism now. And maybe if we don't see it in our lifetime, our children will see a completely liberated Palestine, inshallah. So we we have to understand these, these time scales. But that was nearly a century of oppression the Muslims were living under. But what were they doing in that time that led to Salah al-Din being able to check on his soldiers the night before the, the battle. He went to check their tents at night time to see whether they were praying. Because he said, once he saw them praying, the Qiyam, in Ramadan, he said, now we're ready. We're ready for the battle. It wasn't, you need a good night rest. No, no, you need to be praying. You need to be engaged in Salah. This is the most important battle of your life tomorrow. So you need to be ready. And the way you're ready is not in a dunyavi perspective, but in a spiritual perspective. You need to be standing in Salah. So, in the hundred years before that, what's happening? Nur al-Din al-Zengi is preparing the Muslim for jihad. 
texts have been written about jihad, books have been written about jihad. Um, people, the virtues of Al-Aqsa have been propagated. The whole Madara system has been changed to keep a focus on jihad and focus on the Al-Aqsa. This is what's happening in the years where the Muslims are living under occupation of the Crusaders. So it wasn't a situation where we just retreat to our masajid or we make dua. No, there was activity happening. There was proaction happening. People were taking steps to try to liberate Al-Aqsa and prepare the ground in which a Salah ad-Din could arise. Because Salah ad-Din does not arise in a vacuum. It doesn't come out of nowhere. There has to be, the, the soil has to be fertile that gives rise to, to, to plants like Salah ad-Din, al um, It's impossible for him to come out of the system where, where people are away from the deen, away from jihad. So Nur al-Din Zengi's role in this is really, really important what he does. And that gives rise to the ability of Salah ad-Din and his soldiers to come forward. Um, again, in, later on, we have the Battle of Anjalut in Palestine again against the Mongols, who no one thought could be defeated. They were so, the, their savagery was so crazy. And the, the amount of land they were taking and the barbarity which they were executing people, they sent sh shockwaves across the Ummah. I mean, the narrations, the famous one is that a, a Mongol woman would come to a Muslim and tell him, you know, I forgot to, my, my sword, wait here, I'm going to go get it and then I'm going to come execute you. And he would be so afraid, he would wait, and she would go get a sword, come back and execute it. Estimated two million people killed in the sacking of Baghdad. You know, the streets filled with blood. And these people, again, were just marauding across the Muslim world. And they wanted to take the Makkah and Medina. Yet at the Battle of Anjalut, on the 27th night of Ramadan, the one we all value so much, and we, we pack our message it, these people are fighting this battle and they win. This They set back the Mongols at this time. I mean, the Mongols were seen to the Muslims at the time. They thought they were like Yajur or Majuj. That's what they were, the feeling was. And yet when they're defeated by the Muslims, the Mongols begin to think these people must be divinely inspired. They must have some connection. And they do. That's, that's the only possible explanation for their defeating the Mongols. Just like today, we see in Afghanistan how the Muslims are defeated the entire world, the entire world, bar anyone. Everyone is against them. And yet for 20 years, they fought tooth and nail. This, you know, you can, they're not heavily equipped, they've got no heavy arms, no nuclear weapons, but Allah gave them victory because of their connection to, to, to him. That's the key point. I mean, more contemporary examples, we talk about Ramadan during oppression. I'm not sure how many of you can remember what happened in 2004 in Iraq and Fallujah. But this was a city of mosques and a huge, you know, massacre was happening for one month, the entire Ramadan, the American and British uh, forces were engaged in mass atrocities, suppressing the resistance. And uh, I still remember, you know, in our, in our local masjid for Tarawi, uh, there were many a demonstration outside the US embassy. And uh, this was happening in the last 10 nights. And the sheikh actually said, we need to be there. You know, I'm going to be there. I will be there myself. And I, everyone here should be there tomorrow night. You know, that's where we pray. No one followed him. You know, there was a few people, but the bulk of the, the Masalis did not go. And he, I think he left the, masal, the masjid after I went to another one because he was so disappointed. He said, our brothers are being butchered. Our sisters are being raped. And we're just staying in the masjid because we have, this is our cultural Islam we've developed. And that's what we really have to actually be focused on, the action part of it. Look at our brothers and sisters in Xinjiang, in East Turkestan, what's happening to them. Ramadan is banned for them. I mean, the month is there, but there's no fasting. I mean, they will actually check to see that your lights are on in the morning. So if your lights are on in the morning, they, they send spies around to check the houses of the Muslim. If your lights are on in the, before dawn, that means you must be having suhoor and you will be arrested. So people are having suhoor in the dark. That's their resistance, that's their resilience. In universities and schools, I have clients, legal clients, who told me that in the universities, in their schools, in their workplaces, because they're not meant to be fasting, they can't deliberately bring sweets or food and they offer it to everyone, including the Muslims, to see uh, what they basically will, uh, who's fasting, who's not. And obviously at that point, you can either resist and not take the, day, the, the food they're giving you, or uh, and we then risk detention and torture, maybe execution. 
or you will engage in, 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 in essentially being compelled to, to, to break your fast for that moment. But these are the tests that the Muslims in, in China are going through. I mean, they're literally a ban from fasting. There's a full ban on the fasting. I mean, last year it was over 65 to fast, but now everyone is banned from fasting. And that's the oppression they're facing. But they're resisting. They, are, um, they, these people. I mean, I can't even, I can't even think of how they how, how they live their lives with this resilience. To read the Quran was banned from people in university. Again, clients are telling me this. They can't read the Quran. They can't possess a copy of the Quran. So they would go to graveyards and with a small mushaf and they'd read it in the graveyard because this where the only place we can we can hide and we can maybe conceal our faith. So these trials that we hear about that happened in the Spanish Inquisition for the Muslims, we're sort of seeing it in our modern times again. And we have to remember that this is happening. And again, Ramadan in times of oppression, Ramadan is in times of oppression. This is the resistance, this is the resilience we have to show. We have to understand all of us. We, have, we are living a, a far more comfortable life than so many of our brothers and sisters. That's why we are disconnected. We don't understand Ramadan because our Ramadan is the iftar plate is the Tarawi, is the beautiful recitation. Their Ramadan is Badr. Their Ramadan is Uhud. Their Ramadan is Khandak. That's their Ramadan. That's why they are connected. That's why they benefit more. And that's why they realize the importance of Ramadan. Our brothers and sisters in detention, the brothers in Guantanamo Bay, how do they fast? How do they even know what time it is to break fast? I wish Brother Asim was here because he's written obviously a book on it. Um, I haven't had a, the opportunity to read the book yet, but he interviewed prisoners from all over the world about how they dealt with these issues when in detention. What was their Ramadan like? And finally, to finish off, you look at Gaza. Um, incredible. I mean, the true meaning of Ramadan has never been clearer to us. Well, now that we can see it live stream, we may not have the ability to see what's happening in China on Guantanamo, we may choose not to, but we can't avoid Gaza. It's live streamed, the genocide. And what's also live streamed is the resistance, is the resilience, that they are praying in the rubble, lining up in their masses, knowing that a bomb could fall at any moment. They are memorizing Quran. There's a sister in our community who's from Gaza, and she was telling us that so many people have memorized the Quran during the last five months. So many children become her father during the last five months. In Ramadan, it doesn't end. They carry on, the Mujahideen keep fighting. The people keep memorizing, the people keep praying. They keep in, people keep making dua. They're having iftar amidst the rubble. Simple iftar, but it's found on the list. The people in the south of Gaza are worried about the people in the north who have no food. They feel guilty even though they have barely anything themselves. The people in the north are feeling guilty because they have houses still to live in, where the people in the south have nothing. It's all obliterated. They're living in tents. And so even amongst the Palestinians I've met, they, they almost joke about this, that this is the, the choice you have, either shelter or food. Um, and that's what their Ramadan is looking like. And remember, they've had horrific Ramadans in the last 16 years in Gaza. There's been this siege where basic food items, basic medical items have not been allowed in. Obviously, the genocide, we have to really be careful about saying this genocide started five months ago. This has been going on for decades. It only intensified in the last few months. But the, the politics, uh, the tactic of starvation that's been happening for a long time. The calorie count is so many, you, each person in Gaza can only have this much calories just to avoid dying of starvation. And that intensified in the last five months. But for, for like 15 years, they had this calorie count, just about enough to survive. So this starvation, probably this hardship that they are living, every Ramadan in and out. But look what it's prepared them for. Look what these people are able to, to show almost superhuman resilience. Like this is something that, is maturing about the Sahaba. You, you look at it, you can't understand it. You see that uh, the the uh, Khalid, the uncle who lost the, the soul of my soul, and how much you know dawah he's done just by his actions. So many Muslim, non Muslims embrace Islam, seeing him, just seeing his sabr, seeing his not just sabr on what he lost himself, but how he's giving and, and joining sabr on everybody else, on people who lose their legs, children who lost their legs, their limbs. Again, this is the resilience that hardship builds up in you. And Ramadan after Ramadan, if we suffer hardship, that will only push us closer to the goal of Ramadan, which is what? 
to establish taqwa. So if we want a Ramadan where we truly, truly establish taqwa, and taqwa meaning being closer to Allah, being conscious of Allah, and abandoning the material world with all its 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 beautification. That means leaving this 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 cultural lifestyle Ramadan that we've developed in the West, unfortunately. Um, and going back to the defining moment to Ramadan, the defining threshold by which we mark Ramadan, and that is the Battle of Badr. So inshallah, I hope that um, in some way helps to address the topic. Again, uh, I'm not sure if that's what Asif would have talked about, but I hope it is beneficial. And uh, I certainly found it beneficial even preparing the topic. So I'm uh, grateful for the invitation and the opportunity. Jazakumullah khair.